And when you see some of the other mega trends, like uh, when they did the survey last, they were coming towards the end, maybe of a big spruce bugworm epidemic. Right, right. Uh, so back then, you would have seen a lot of birds that really liked those to eat those spruce bugworms. Yes. Evening grosbeaks beaks were really plentiful back when we were all growing up, or at least when I was. I'm older yes. than you are. <laughs> I remember. Well, I remember stories. Yeah, exactly. Well, I remember the actual thing. I know. <laughs> This is Bob Deshane's Wild Maine. I would imagine that just about everyone on this end of Maine has seen snowshoe hares. If you drive around Maine's dirt roads early in the morning, you can often see them popping out of the woods. Did you know Maine also has cottontail rabbits? Well, we do, but not many. They're an endangered species in Maine, and we're trying to figure out how to keep them around before they're gone forever. That'll be later in the show. We start with a potential new project to figure out where all the birds are in Maine. I mean, all of them. Forty years ago, Maine's first breeding bird atlas was researched and produced essentially a statewide map of where all Maine's breeding birds breed. Well, we're doing it again. It's an ambitious project to be led by the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife with support from several wildlife organizations and a bunch of other experts from around the state, including me. Today's show is brought to you by Hammond Lumber, Napa Auto Parts, and EBS. There's a lot of ways to test what's going on in nature and the environment. Mother Nature will give you clues if you're paying attention. Birds are a remarkable indicator. You can see them, you can hear them, and there's already a lot of people looking for them. If you map out where they are and how their location changes over time, you can get a really good picture of how our environment and the natural resources landscape is changing. Early planning is now underway, and the job of consulting all this falls on one person. I am Adrian Leppold. I'm a wildlife biologist in the bird group with the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Adrian, welcome to Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Bob. So um, there's a brand new project that is just at the very beginning stages. It's a breeding bird atlas. What is that? Well, biological atlases in general, the goal is just to get an idea of species abundance and distribution over a certain area, over a fixed period of time. And bird atlases have become very common and popular because um, a wide effort like this across an entire state takes a lot of uh, help and resources and Birds are easily recognizable by a lot of people, and people identify birds. So it's easy to have individuals go out and do what they would be normally doing and Mm -hmm. just give us that information about where birds are. There's a lot of people looking for birds, but not a lot of people looking for star-nosed voles. No, not so much, (laughs) unless they're digging up their gardens. Well, I guess maybe that's part of the point is birds aren't all that hard to find. And uh, this time of year, they're singing and telling you where they are. Try that with a star nose voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not so much. There are some secretive birds, though, and our hope is to have um, some special surveys as part of this broader atlas project that will go out and identify some secretive marsh birds or nocturnal species like owls or night hawks that mm. um, would require some extra special survey efforts. I would so do that. So, All right, you're yeah, hired. I know it, yeah. <laughs> um, so a breeding bird atlas sort of does what? The entire state, segments of the state, or what's the vision of this? Our goal is the entire state. So there was actually a first atlas done in um, the late 70s. It's usually a five-year project, and nationally the sort of prescribed plan is that they're done every 20 years statewide. Ours was for our first one was from seventy eight to eighty three, and <laughs> so that we're a little overdue. <laughs> we're a little overdue, long overdue. So um, yes, our goal is to do the entire state, and I think given we have a lot more um, outreach resources available to us in this day and age than they did in the seventies. So our hope for this project is that we get coverage everywhere. It was a little bit sparse in the uh, Northwoods <laughs> area of the state for the first Alice. So we're hoping to get um, some really good coverage, especially in the northern and western parts of the state that are more remote. Um, statewide, five-year project. In fact, back up in 1978, <clears throat> a lot of the roads didn't exist. Probably didn't even exist. Yeah. That's very true. Mm-hmm. Good point. Well, I'm going to make a guess. Birds are plentiful. Uh, they're visible. They're audible. There's a whole variety of them. 
and we have hundreds of species in Maine, and each one has a particular habitat preference. So if you figure out where the birds are, you can actually measure what's going on on the ground with the actual habitats and with the developments and changes in the ecosystem. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of changes. We have a lot of habitat um, change happening. There are shifts in distribution, uh, probably mostly related to climate change. I, I think it's likely we'll get some new species that maybe haven't been you know, weren't documented as breeding birds in the state in the first atlas that have moved up or certainly wider distribution, things like cardinals even. Oh, I mean, no kidding. 20, 30 years ago, they were not that common mm -hmm. in the state. And now everybody's telling me about their backyard cardinals that mm. are bringing their young to the feeders. And yep. I think that's noteworthy. I think that means something. I bet when we compare our results this time to how many vultures they saw in 1978, there's a big difference. Yes. Yeah. Well, and even I, like sandhill cranes breed yeah. in Maine now, mm -hmm. and they weren't documented in the first atlas. Here. So we'll get some good uh, changes of species diversity. But the other thing that this atlas is setting out to do is also give us some good baseline data on abundances. Mm -hmm. um, the first atlas, we don't have numbers. We just have kind of a general distribution of species diversity but we don't have anything to base population estimates off of. And so it's really hard to make management decisions and conservation actions when you don't have information about what's happening. So in addition to just identifying and documenting change in species distribution, we can, uh, we're incorporating abundance sampling as part of this Atlas effort as well. So we'll actually get numbers mm -hmm. that we can compare and have something to go back to 15 or 20 years from now. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's important to know what's where. It's just as important to know whether they're increasing or decreasing. Yes, because absolutely. Trends tell you stuff. Yes, that's exactly it. And mm -hmm. birds are great indicators of the environment, and they have a huge economic uh, contribution and role in the state of Maine. We have over half of the species of birds that occur in North America – occur in Maine during some point of their annual life cycle. And so people are get excited about that. We have population of about 1.3 million um, people in mm -hmm. Maine, something like that. It is 1.3. Okay. And the, in the, in a fish and wildlife survey, it was a few years ago now where they were kind of surveying the public on outdoor recreation activities more than 700,000 of our 1.3 million residents commented that they either actively watch birds or feed birds or enjoy some kind of bird activity. Was that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service survey yes. they do every five years? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. We At one point, the percentage of our population uh, that watch birds was number two, only I think to, I want to say Minnesota. Oh, Minnesota That's... or Montana. It was one of, one of those two was just slightly ahead of us. Well, because we're so diverse. Yeah. Maine, Maine, Maine's habitat and bird life is so diverse. It's, it's, and, you know, people are really invested and mm -hmm. care about the natural world and natural resources up here. So I think this has the potential to be a really popular project. Well, you get people interested in watching wildlife if they actually have some. Yes. I mean, how many people get excited about wildlife watching in New Jersey? <laughs> That's very true. Just saying. <laughs> well, well, and that's a good point is that this project, you know, the, the scope of this is to attract everyone from, you know, the hardcore bird watcher yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's on to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you're officially recruited. Uh -huh. And um, to, you know, somebody that just pays attention to what's in their own backyard. Mm -hmm. Those That kind of information is going to be valuable for this project. And I think that helps um, volunteers and individuals around the state who could get it interested and involved. It helps connect them to our department more, too. I think mm -hmm. there's kind of been this common perception that the uh, inland fisheries and wildlife or state game commissions usually are very just game and hunting and fishing focused. And we're not. We have more than half of our staff are actually non-game biologists um, or focus on non-game species mm -hmm. or habitat conservation. And so I think this is a good way to connect our department with 
the constituents yeah. in the state, too. Well, and it really has to be that way. Uh-huh. It's really easy to focus on deer, moose, bear, turkey, whatever. Yes. Whatever your game <laughs> animal, it's easy to focus on those, but they're part of a whole ecosystem. And if you screw up the ecosystem, your game animals start to go away. Yep. So, you know, later on in the show, we'll be talking to uh, one of your biologists about cottontail rabbits. Oh, down, great. Down in uh, southern Maine. And here's a species that maybe there's only 300 left in Maine. It's declined, it's declined just about everywhere. And that's telling us something about the environment that warns us that if we're screwing this up, maybe we're screwing up something else, too. Yeah. So if we don't study the non-game species, we often don't get those clues until it's too late. For ourselves. Yeah, that, yeah birds are excellent indicators mm. of environmental health. And I, I think that they have huge value to mm. human health and on that, you know, on yeah. that same level. My guest is Adrian Lippold, the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Biologist in charge of creating a new breeding bird atlas. I'm one of the birding experts in the steering committee. There are some big challenges to pulling this off. There's a short season for surveying bird populations before they all migrate out. And there's a shortage of people considering how much of the state is going to be mapped. How might all of this affect you? That's next when Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine returns on Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. Saturday mornings at 9, Sunday mornings at 8 on Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. Forty years ago, Maine mapped out where all the breeding birds are. In 40 years, that's changed a bit. And understanding those changes is an early clue about whether we're doing things all right or we're doing irreparable harm to our natural resources. The wildlife biologist who is heading this up in the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife is Adrian Lippold. You can actually watch the map of birds change as conditions of Maine change. I'm thinking about Eastern Meadowlark. Oh, uh, yeah. I used to be able to get those up in Patton. I could get them in Bering just outside of Callis over at Moosehorn National Wildlife Refuge. I don't get them there anymore because they've just sort of slowly melted away. It's a grassland bird. We just lost grasslands. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Farm fields have gone back to woods in some places uh, or subdivisions in southern Maine. So, you know, you watch these mega trends going on. And that's what the Atlas can teach us. Something happened out there, and it, it's one of the first things that can call our attention to it. Well, and I think, too, you know, our role um, as the state department for fish and wildlife is to conserve these resources. And I think when where we document species in decline or changes in distribution, and we start to see if we're losing this diversity, that information provides us the ability to make good conservation management decisions and target efforts to try to conserve species in need or just to um, create management actions that keep common birds common, mm-hmm. that prevent common birds from going into decline. So Yeah, they really are like the canary in the coal mine. Yep. If you start to lose some birds, Absolutely. Then, then you may be losing your deer next, which has certainly happened in parts of Maine. And we see some of the other mega trends, like uh, when they did the survey last, they were coming towards the end, maybe of a big spruce budworm epidemic. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> so back then, you would have seen a lot of birds that really liked those to eat those spruce budworms. Yes, evening gross beaks were really plentiful back when we were all growing up, or at least when I was. I'm older yes. than you are. <laughs> I rem- Well, I remember stories. Yeah, exactly. well, I remember the actual thing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, other specialists like Cape May Warbler used to be much more common than it is now, and that was probably a spruce budworm thing. Well. It was, and it's interesting because I, I actually, looking at, it's funny you brought up Cape Mays, because I, I found an image online a few months ago of a Cape May at a nest, and the nest had like eight eggs in it, <laughs> eight to ten eggs, and I'm going, who is this artist? What is this? And it, it was in a very, it was in Birds of North America online mm-hmm. account. I'm thinking, this is a reputable, I have to go to this document. I Most songbirds lay four eggs, typically four or five and so a small Cape May having a clutch of eight was that was brand new information to me. And that's exactly what drives that is that when they they sort of prepare or hedge their bets for possible outbreaks of resources that could allow them to successfully pull off that many young. I mean, you can stuff your kids with lots of spruce web worms. Yeah. You can raise a lot of babies. <laughs> well, and we're on the verge of another outbreak yeah. now. So this could be. And I'm starting to see more Cape Mays again. You can And more evening gross beaks are coming down, I think, from New Brunswick where the outbreak is. Yeah. But, It'll be interesting mm-hmm. to see what kind of patterns and trends this mm. 
information from this atlas can produce. So do other states actually do atlases too? Oh, absolutely. We're we're actually quite far behind the curve <laughs> on uh, catching up with our atlasing. Whoops. <laughs> Um, so it's, but it's, it's, you know, it's never too late. And this was a conservation action written into our, um, 2015 state wildlife action plan to conduct this atlas. A lot of other states, I think Massachusetts just recently completed their second, even up in the Maritimes in Quebec. This is an international, Mm. uh, conservation effort and project that we have pretty standardized methods written around and uh, I guess the advantage one a big advantage of us being a little behind the curve here is that everybody else has figured out what not to do so, <laughs> we, so we, we can learn from their mistakes we can learn from their mistakes and we don't have to reinvent the wheels so we can just yeah. kind of get things going how does a survey get done so with it being a statewide project we have gridded out the entire state into small little sections called blocks. We have over 4,900 blocks identified for the state of Maine. That sounds a little bit daunting. It does. When you think that this effort, the goal is to get somebody out into every one of those blocks and record information about the birds they're seeing. So that's basically the short end of it, um, is just to go out, identify, pay attention to birds that are around you. There are different levels of confirmation. For example, if you find a nest, Mm -hmm. that's going to mean more than if you just heard a bird singing in an area once. Um, And so there'll be different levels that people would record data based on what their observations are. But it's very flexible and open. Um, Individuals can go out and survey when they're able during the breeding season And in addition to that citizen science contribution, we're also going to be hiring some paid technicians to go out and do more formal, strict, standardized surveys. But that's kind of a separate part. (laughs) Well, I mean, uh, does your birder have to be of a certain caliber? Do you test anybody? So... It's it's all levels. Um, There are... There will be certain codes that... um, And kind of checks that get written in so that errant records get filtered out if somebody makes a species identification or if something really doesn't make sense for a range it'll have to be verified if the rare species would have to get photographed um there there will be what we call safe dates where if you have a species outside of the range of safe Mm -hmm. dates for breeding it's likely that it could be a migrant and so we won't count it so there's there's checks built into the programs and the project so that really anybody of any experience level can contribute some data and most people i think would be surprised you know if they started really just thinking about some of the common birds that they even know and recognize they'd probably surprise themselves at how many they do know Mm -hmm. you know most people chickadees and robins those are pretty easily recognizable blue jays (laughs) cardinals crows Mm -hmm. so any of those records are valuable i just went to um I'm participating in the main bumblebee atlas <laughs> and uh, we'll give a plug for that project too. But as part of that training, one of the instructors there was talking about how the rarest um, individual that he ever documented for one of these big atlas projects was found in his front yard. Oh, right. Yeah. So, and it was actually a new record for the state of Maine or something. I think it was a dragonfly project mm-hmm. separate, but they were talking about it at this point the bumblebee atlas meeting and that it just goes to show you every every record will count and every person's contribution is going to yeah. matter that's adrian lippel wildlife biologist with the main department of inland fisheries and wildlife and we've been talking about the creation of a new breeding bird atlas for the state of maine that is just now getting underway up next we'll be joined by Corey stearns another ifw biologist who is studying cottontail rabbits in maine They're endangered and nearly gone. You'll get the story in a moment. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. Saturday mornings at 9, Sunday mornings at 8 on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. Forty years ago, Maine mapped out where all the breeding birds are. In 40 years, that's changed a bit. And understanding those changes is an early clue about whether we're doing things all right or we're doing irreparable harm to our natural resources. 
The wildlife biologist who is heading this up in the main department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife is Adrian Lippold. Obviously, you're not going to do a lot of surveying while migration is still going on because you can't really tell where the bird is going to end up. Right. Uh, so you would start after most of the flying is done and they've settled into nesting. So that's true for the large percentage of birds breeding in our state, but you get species like um, owls and eagles. Mm -hmm. Those birds start their breeding season as early as February up here. They're nest building and courting. And so individuals can be out, um, you know, taking observations and submitting data for species from February through to even September, October for some really late nesting birds. And so that's why we have those safe dates is that mm -hmm. even if somebody is out looking for owls and they see a yellow rumped warbler, <laughs> you know, prior to the end of May that mm -hmm. yellow, or beginning of June, that yellow rumped warbler isn't going to count. Mm -hmm. Okay. So where are we in the planning stage right now? We are in the planning year. So... <laughs> <laughs> So it's all planning now. We don't start surveying till 2018. 2018. Our data collection years will be 2018 through 2022. And with a couple years post that planned for analysis and write-up of a final product that sort of mm -hmm. summarizes all of this. But one of the cool things about atlasing in the 21st century is that volunteers will be able to kind of see things real time as well. So their contributions as they submit observations will be available on the website where they can actually track how mm. their effort has contributed to this progress. And other people's. Yes. Yes. Yep. So you exactly. Can, you can see all the dots show up on a map yep. for any species as this goes on. So this is sort of kind of a stay tuned, mm -hmm. this is coming uh, pitch for the project. <laughs> we are hoping to have some kind of outreach efforts mobilized by the end of summer, early mm -hmm. fall. Yep. So is there a citizen science opportunity here where you need volunteers to go out and do it? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. The entire project is solely dependent. The success of this project is solely dependent on citizen science contributions. Because if, if you have 4,900 <laughs> different locations, there aren't that many expert birders in the no. state. You're going to need a lot of backyard birders to yep. be able to contribute to this. Well, and if anybody's ever looked for that perfect excuse to venture out into the North Country or Roostick County or mm -hmm. Western Mountains of Maine, and they haven't yet, this is it. Just take a weekend camping trip and do some birding. And <laughs> Oh, you're talking you about go. my happy hunting ground. <laughs> <laughs> I will get into the woods every chance I get. I'm uh, hoping for a couple thousand volunteers at least. Yeah. So when it's all said and done, what is this going to look like? So we will have, there are a lot of other products that uh, have come from other states that folks who are curious could go and look at to get an, a visual idea. Um, every single species of bird documented in the state of Maine will have a written species account describing and explaining the current data that we collected and mm -hmm. comparing that to any historical distribution data we have. And it will all be mapped out. So we'll actually can visually see where birds are occurring in the state compared to where they were from the first atlas. And um, it will provide us information about relationships between the birds and the habitats that they're occupying and where that is exact, where those mm -hmm. are in Maine exactly. There has to be a certain amount of quality checking. There must be a bird that would show up on somebody's list in Aroostook County and you would say, it couldn't have been. Like a grasshopper sparrow. Yeah, for instance, yeah. good example, yeah. So those, those again, those are going to be kind of those checks will be built into the data entry process mm -hmm. and that record would get flagged and somebody, one of our experts would follow up with that individual and say, you know, we need you to submit some more detailed information or do you have photographs or right. this would be an unlikely species. So if it can't be validated, then... Um, that record would probably mm -hmm. get thrown out. And for anyone who's wondering, what is a grasshopper sparrow? It is sort of a grassland sparrow that <laughs> just barely gets across the border into southern Maine. Uh, Kennebunk Plains has them. Uh, there's a, a couple. Uh, there's a place in Hiram I just learned about that has a bunch of them. Yep. Uh, but they really don't get north of there. 
I think the farthest north has been, there was one confirmed in Augusta yeah, area exactly. at one point. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, they really don't. But it's a main state endangered species. Yes, so mm-hmm. we care a lot about that mm-hmm. now, little grassland bird in Maine. <laughs> well, And we should because, uh, again, if that's shrinking, then maybe our grassland habitat is shrinking or some, or they're being turned into golf courses or being turned into subdivisions. And that shows you what's happening in the face of the planet when you just follow what these birds are doing. Absolutely. So we're talking breeding birds. Uh, are we going to do anything in the winter? Oh, that's a good question. So our hope is, so we 2018 will start data collection for breeding birds. I think it might take a couple years for us to get momentum going, but our plan is to incorporate some winter atlasing as well, hopefully for a few years at the tail end of this project. It's never been done in Maine. I think we have a completely you know, different diversity of species that occurs in the winter and we would be one of very few states in North Mm. America to tackle such a dual challenge with breeding and wintering but I think we're up to the task. Well we would be the perfect state to do it because uh, we have a lot of uh, ducks that come down from Hudson Bay and winter off our coast. We have a lot of what we call eruptive birds that come down from Canada Yes, uh, sometimes in big numbers and you people see pine grosbeaks in their apple trees sometimes for instance. Yep well you were talking about evening grosbeaks. Yep. Mm -hmm. So all that happens in the winter snowy owls great gray (laughs) owls this was a good year for that so, all right. Uh, anything else the public should know about this? Um, just that it's kind of good to, we want to put it on people's radar now that it's going to be happening. Um, and it's a completely, you know, again, the success is just going to be dependent on this citizen science volunteer effort and contribution um, and the connection with the state and just mm-hmm. kind of stay tuned. So we'll have more information and how to get connected and it's a great training opportunity too because if even if you don't know birds and you Mm. always sort of wanted to as part of this project we're going to be offering training workshops for how to go out in atlas and so through this outreach we're hoping to even make birders out of people who didn't know they could (laughs) could or even wanted to be well i know i'm going to stay tuned because you're going to make sure i do a lot of work yes i will keep you busy bob That's Adrian Lippold, wildlife biologist with the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. And we've been talking about the creation of a new breeding bird atlas for the state of Maine that is just now getting underway. Up next, we'll be joined by Corey Stearns, another IFW biologist who is studying cottontail rabbits in Maine. They're endangered and nearly gone. You'll get the story in a moment. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. I don't know how much you get outdoors and how many of Maine's most elusive critters you've seen, but I'll be surprised if even one listener right now has ever seen a cottontail rabbit in this state. We do have them, and they are state endangered, and that means we can't just turn our backs on them. As usual, the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife is stuck with the job of trying to prevent another Maine species from going the way of the caribou and cougar into local extinction. I've got Corey Stearns on the phone. Tell him who you are, Corey. I'm Corey Stearns, one of the regional wildlife biologists for Maine and Land Fisheries and Wildlife. Well, Corey, welcome to Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. I have uh, I have never seen a cottontail rabbit in Maine, so what am I doing wrong? Well, they're very rare. We think there's only about 300 left in the state. Um, they had only about 30 sites or so, um, all south of Portland, primarily coastal. Um, they're hard, very hard to see because they're, they have a, an affinity for really dense, thick areas, um, the kind of the, kind of areas where you look at and say, well, I don't really want to walk it. <laughs> That's kind of the stuff that the, the cottontails live in, um, so they are very difficult to, to see. Well, I would think the ones that are not difficult to see would be the ones that would be eaten first, so of course right. the only ones left are the ones that stay in the brush. Right, exactly, yes. Yeah. Uh, every predator on the landscape will, the landscape will eat rabbits, so... Yeah. Um, they really really stick to the uh, cover as much as they can. Well, of course, in my end of Maine, we have a lot of snowshoe hares. So what is the difference between a hare and a rabbit? Mm-hmm. So uh, in Maine, yeah, we have the snowshoe hare, which is pretty common. It occurs uh, statewide. Probably more, it's more common in northern Maine than southern Maine, but they, they do still occur in southern Maine. Um, and the New England cottontail, those are the two species of uh, bunnies that we have. Um, snowshoe hares are a little bit bigger. Uh, they have... Uh, longer uh, feet, 
which are snowshoe shaped, whereas the uh, or leaf tracks of the snowshoe shaped, whereas the cottontail is smaller, um, need more of an oval shape. They have smaller feet, smaller ears, um, and uh, the biggest difference, the easiest way to tell them apart is in winter the snowshoe hairs change to white whereas the cottontail stay brown all winter was this a case of uh, having a common ancestor and then diverging into two species or were they distantly related species and are now converging right there yeah, yeah, some some uh, they're kind of, kind of cousins i guess hares and rabbits are kind of distinct groups um but they're, they're related they're all in the uh, lagomorphidae family the, and rabbit family, but um, so they're related, but somewhat distantly, I guess. <laughs> so our cottontails, the ones we have in Maine, are they their own species, uh, a subspecies of another cottontail family, or what exactly are they? Yep, they're uh, uh, cottontail species that, until the early '90s, they were grouped with what's now called Appalachian cottontail, which occurs kind of west of the Hudson and down through the. Uh, down into uh, the southern U.S., but um, since uh, that was, they were separated by genetic work um, that showed that they were two distinct species, um, so the New England cottontail is um, the only native cottontail to New England that occurs in the uh, six New England states, plus the very eastern part of New York, uh, east of the Hudson River. Okay, so I, I guess I should back up a moment and, and ask you, what is a subspecies, uh, since these aren't? Right. Yeah, subspecies would be um, kind of a distinct group uh, uh, um, within a species. Uh, the species is still it still can interbreed with other other smaller groups of the uh, of the other subspecies. But um, there is some some distinct uh, difference between between them. Okay. So our cottontails are what are they threatened, endangered? What's their legal status? Yeah. Legally, they are a state endangered species in Maine, uh, also a state endangered species in New Hampshire. Um, they were also uh, a candidate for federal listing under the Federal Endangered Species Act um, until 2015 when the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service decided not to list them. Um, and they made that decision primarily because of um, uh, the six states within, within the current New England cottontail range grouped together and formed a uh, New England Cottontail Working Group um, to work collaboratively towards their restoration, and the states have made uh, certain commitments towards uh, improving the uh, status of the cottontails in their states, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service decided that the, the states were doing well enough on their own that they, they didn't need um, federal protection at that time. So as long as we uh, work hard and uh, start stabilizing and improving cotton, the co status of the cottontails in Maine and elsewhere in their range, then um, they should avoid federal listing, but they, if, um, if we can't do that, then federal listing could, could be an option down, down the road. That's actually uh, a development in the Endangered Species Act uh, over the last couple of decades, really, where um, listing is really the, the last resort. Uh, because once you actually list something as federally endangered, then a whole lot of uh, resource protections and habitat protections kick in. They can really impact uh, local property. Uh, and so if you can avoid that, if you can work out some kind of arrangement where you're doing your best to be stewards of these species that are a little more flexible, then you can avoid uh, the heavy hand of the federal government coming down and telling you to do it otherwise. Right, absolutely. Yeah, we've got quite a coalition of people that we're working with uh, here in Maine. Um, we have a specific Maine, New England, cottontail working group that includes um, Rachel Carson National Wildlife Refuge has been a huge partner. They manage a lot, quite a few of their area uh, land for for cottontails. We've got land trust, private landowners, all working towards um, improving the status of cottontails in Maine. So. What is the known history of cottontails? Do we always have a lot? Do we always have just a few? Do did the Indians used to eat them? I mean, what do we know? Right, right. It's pro they, their populations over time have probably ebbed and flowed as uh, the appropriate habitat conditions have uh, been here or not. Um, they are young forest specialists, so um, they need the really dense, thick shrubs or young trees. So when that's present, they can uh, their populations can increase. When it's not, and it, they decline. Um, we know they've been in Maine for quite a while because they're. Uh, and cottontail remains are found in some Native American middens and actually in Penobscot Bay, of all places. Um, 
they're more of the fans out there, I think. Um, so we know they've been around a long time. Um, we think they probably met, were at their peak in distribution in about the 1960s um, because there had been a lot of farm abandonment in the early 1800s, uh, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. So as those became shrubs and then trees, and the cocktails kind of spread out. Um, so uh, they, they were probably as far inland as southern Oxford County, maybe uh, Lewis and Auburn, and as far east as uh, Belfast. Uh, at that time, um, and since then, as the, those forests have become older, they've become bigger trees um, with less and less understory, um, and with no thickets to hide in, and in the understory, the cottontails can't survive. So they've gradually retreated um, back into their current uh, to their current state, which is you know, south of Portland, primarily coastal, um, very small population. You're listening to Corey Stearns. I managed to track down the bunny biologist of the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, and he's the guy in charge of keeping the remaining cottontail rabbits in Maine alive. Or at least alive until something eats them. Almost everything does. So how do you keep alive a creature that is food for so many other creatures? Stand by. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. Welcome back to Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. I've got Corey Stearns on the phone, and not a very good phone either. He's the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Biologist who's trying to figure out how to keep cottontail rabbits from going extinct in Maine. It's hard to preserve a species when absolutely everything eats it. Uh, now, there are no Canada lynx in southern Maine, so what eats cottontails exactly? Everything. Yep. Right, so everything, that, every predator that there is in southern Maine, so bobcats, coyotes, fox, um, owl, cock, weasels, even house cats have been known to grab them. So. That's got to be a little difficult in the population, right? So that yeah, that makes it hard um, because the, you know the immediate the cause of you know death for cottontails is usually because of predation. Um, but the re- so it can yeah. But the re- real reason for the decline and the the major decline is lack of habitat. The thick, brushy areas that they need to hide in. Is, to hide from the predators has been declining. Um, so without that habitat, they stick out, um, particularly in winter, because they stay stay brown all winter. Um, so that you know they they have a very high mortality rate, um, which makes restoration difficult. But if we provide the uh, high quality, dense thickets that they like, then um, they can they can make a comeback. What is the life expectancy, do you think, since none of them seem to die of old age? Right, yeah, the very uh, few make it past a year, very few make it past two years. Really? Yeah, right. Yeah, there's, there's just yeah, so many predators on the landscape that uh, they get eaten very quickly. Um, you know, in the circle of life, rabbits have been designed to, to basically feed, uh, feed the predators. Um, they're, they're designed to have... Um, to be very uh, productive, they uh, they have four to six young uh, per litter and up to three litters per year. So um, they produce a lot of young, put the rabbits on the landscape, and eventually you know, the predators get them and little little them down through the year till the next breeding cycle, and um, they can repopulate. Boy, you got to have a lot of babies in a short period of time if you're going to keep a population going. Right? Yeah. Yeah, you do. Can you actually, when you catch a rabbit, can you actually tell how old it is? Is there a way to age these things? Uh, no, not that I know of. No. Uh, Do um, rabbits carry ticks? They can, yeah. They can carry ticks or uh, fleas or mites or whatever. Yeah. So you're seeing much of that? Do they really suffer from it, or is this just not uh, one of the factors that's dooming them? Yeah, it could be an impact in, on particular individuals if they get into a, to a you know, a real bunch of them or something, but we haven't noticed a major impact here in Maine. Really. So how do you actually study these? How do you manage them? How do you study them? How do you figure out where they are, and how do you keep the population going? Yep. So the, the major thing we do to survey uh, to study them is we do winter snow tracking surveys. Um, you can go out after a snowfall and look for tracks and uh, particularly tell it. Um, uh, the tracks for cottontails are generally smaller than snowshoe hare and more oval-shaped. Um, 
course, is a you know, snowshoe or triangular shape for hares. Um, but there is some overlap in the size, so whenever we do a survey, we collect pellets and then send it to the University of New Hampshire. We do a genetic analysis to confirm which species it is. Um, so we do that through the winter to monitor uh, sites that we know have cottontails to make sure they're still there. Um, we look for new areas, and occasionally we get reports from, from the public of um, people seeing cottontails, or at least what they think are cottontails, so we go check those out. Um, so that's the, the main uh, study study method currently. Um, but yeah, to keep to keep them around, yeah, we're where we have an effort where um, there's a New England Cottontail Restoration Coordinator, um, which is partly funded by our department, stationed at Rachel Carson National Wildlife Refuge, um, and the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service has a person stationed at their office in Scarborough, um, and both of those people. Uh, at least part of their duties is to go out and recruit you know, towns and land trusts, private landowners to do uh, young forest management to promote the habitat that cottontails and a wide range of other species need. So uh, I presume since they live such a short period of time, it makes no sense to put a radio collar on them. Yeah, uh, yeah we haven't done that here in Maine. Um, in other states, they, we have done that. Um, uh, it's probably something that we will probably get into here in Maine at some point, but... Is there one particular place, one particular town in Maine that really has more cottontails than anywhere else? Can you point to a location and say, yep, they're right there? Right, yeah, the, uh, the stronghold for the cottontails in the state are in Cape Elizabeth, um, primarily in the, uh, the three state parks down there, Kettle Cove, uh, Crescent Beach, and Two Lakes, and in the surrounding area there. So if I went to any of those parks, would I have a chance to see one? Yep, you have a chance. <laughs> Small chance. <laughs> yeah, best time to see them would probably be first thing in the morning or last thing in the evening. Um, they do come out into open a little bit at those times to forage on clover, the grasses, or um, things like that. But they stay with close, really close to their dense, dense thicket. So if they fear any, you know, fear anything, get scared, they can run back in. So, um, so if you get lucky, you can see them, but it's pretty, pretty hard. Yeah. So if it's a main endangered species, that usually means that we have to alter our behavior somehow. So what are we doing to uh, to continue the habitat they need? Yep. So, yeah, the biggest threat to cottontails is habitat loss, and uh, they're a difficult species to work with because they specialize on young forests. So that requires disturbance to the, to the old mature forest to be able to have this, this young forest. So... Um, historically, it would have been caused by forest fires or um, major insect outbreaks, that sort of thing. But today, um, we try to put a stop to forest fires uh, to prevent damage. So um, the major way we can create habitat now is through timber harvest. Um, so managing forest for some component of young forest um, by you know, cutting areas pretty hard so you get to you know, remove a high, uh, high percentage of the trees and get that light a lot of light hitting the, the ground that stimulates that really really uh, thick growth is a great way to um, produce the habitat um, and, and the uh, habitat fragmentation is really the second second threat um, and that's just that there's, uh, the habitat is now kind of divided um, because of roads, development and that sort of thing um, and since it's rare on the landscape as it is, it's hard for rabbits to get from one one place to a, to another. So um, we need to, we try to work towards trying to connect habitat patches so rabbits can move um, from one place to another successfully. Well, if if they're on all little patches, there must be a lot of inbreeding. Yes, yeah, yeah. Our our uh, even our most robust population in the Cape Elizabeth area has shown that it's got um, a pretty low genetic diversity. So. Um, that's something that we we want to indre- address in the future um, uh, through a uh, translocation program. There's a captive breeding program at, at a couple of, couple zoos, um, one in Providence, Rhode Island, the other in Queens, New York. Um, plus, uh, there's a captive breeding program at, on an island in Rhode Island, and uh, also Great Bay National Wildlife Refuge has now got a couple breeding pens that uh, we provide some assistance in. Uh, constructing, um, and so at some point we hope to be able to bring rabbits from that captive breeding program into Maine and help with our genetic uh, diversity issues. Um, 
hopefully improve it to, to keep the cotton tail healthy. Yeah. Is there a, a healthy population anywhere in New England, or is it threatened everywhere? Uh, um, Connecticut has a really has a pretty robust population. They're doing pretty well down there. Um, but yeah, Maine, Maine and New Hampshire, they're they're in danger. Um, Rhode Island, they were they were down to very few if any native rabbits um, before they started releasing rabbits from the captive breeding program. Well, I think that's it, Corey. I'll let uh, let you get back to work. You can hop to it. All right. Well, great. Thanks for having me. Corey Stearns, the bunny biologist at the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. He's leading the research on preserving New England cottontail rabbits in Maine. Earlier in the show, we chatted with another IFW biologist, Adrian Leppold, about a breeding bird atlas that is in the formative stage. If there's a lesson in today's show, it's this. Watching what happens to wildlife populations can tell you a lot about what's going on in the environment. For instance, a few years ago, we didn't even know how bad acid rain was until all the frogs started dying off. So our state biologists have to be aware of a lot of critters that aren't deer, bear, and moose. They're on top of it. And now I remind you, the show and all previous shows are on the web at 92.9theticket.com, so you can re-listen or share it with others. Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine returns next Saturday morning at 9, Sunday morning at 8. Brought to you by Hammond Lumber, Napa Auto Parts, and EBS. On Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. Oh.